Hi everyone, I'm Chris Saxon. I'm part of Stephen Feuerstein's Oracle Developer Advocate team. It's my job to help you get the best out of Oracle Database and hopefully have a little bit of fun whilst doing so. So with that in mind, it's great that we're having these office hour sessions. So this is your chance to ask your questions about SQL to help you understand and use Oracle Database technology better. Um, I, we only had one question come in in, in advance, but last session around, last time around, quite a few people, we touched on the topic of materialized views and quite a few people said that's something that it's worth covering in a bit more detail. So to start off with, I will have a brief talk about materialized view. We then got one reader question or question in advance, and then we'll just open up for general questions. As always, feel free to put any questions you want in chat at any point, just drop them in. Um, if, you, if it's not clear what I'm saying or you want to know more, then just stick it in chat and I'll pick it up. If you want to speak on the mic, that's great too. Just let me know and I can unmute you or you can unmute yourself even. So let's just bring the slides back up. So we'll get that up and going. So as I said, so this time around, I'm gonna talk about briefly about materialized views and specifically more about the process of refreshing them. So before I get into that, a bit of a discussion about materialized views and why they exist, what's the point of them. So let's say you've got a query like this. You are running, um, want to see the number of orders customers placed each day last month. So back in August, you wanna see daily counts of your order totals. Now, let's say you're a big business, you could have maybe a million orders placed per day. So when you run this, this is going to process over 30 million rows. That's a lot of data. You know, even if you've got kind of got all the toys available to you, you know, exadata in memory, you partition your table correctly and so on, chances are it's going to take a little while, at least a couple of seconds to run to complete that. And if you haven't got all the toys or you've, you know, got some flaws in your underlying design, this could take several minutes to run. So it can take a long time to run this query. And of course, the thing is, we're getting a daily total. It's only ever going to earn at most 31 rows. So that's had a lot of work to get a small set of data at the end. And to kind of get around this problem, a lot of people kind of go, well, hang on. Order data tends not to change very often. You know, once it's placed, maybe some people come back and cancel them or there'll be some revisions. But overall, the trends stay broadly the same. So what we can do is take this data, stick it in a separate table which sounds great, but then you've got to go through the process of changing all your code points at that new table, and you've got to come up with some process to manage all this as well. That's a lot of faff. So for a long time now, we've had this called materialized views, which kind of do that for you. So the principle here is we take the query, run it, and store the results in a table. So you can then access that table to get the pre-computed results. Um, so you might be going to say to yourself, well, what's so great about this? Why would we build that and use this instead of running our own thing? So first off, it, when it comes to actually refreshing the data, there are automatic ways to do that. I'll come to those in a minute. Perhaps the most useful and the coolest part of materialized views is they can work transparently for your application. So let's say you've got your application and you know we've got some reporting dashboard or something like that. And what it's doing is it's continually sending this query to the database and it's saying every five minutes, find this information. So you can do like the month on month or year on year comparison of sales just to make sure everything's broadly okay. Um, so it's come some kind of performance dashboard. You send that query to the database, but because we created that materialized view, instead of running the query itself, the database can go, well, hang on, I've got this data already pre-computed. We can just run that query against materialized view. And you know, we're looking at data for August, so that's 31 rows. You know, it, it doesn't matter how old your hardware is, how slow your disks are, um, how badly you design your database. Reading 31 rows is going to be pretty quick. You know, even if you've actually stored your entire company history in this um, materialized view, say the past, I don't know, 20 or 30 years that you've been digitized, you're still talking less than 10,000 rows probably. Even, you know, that is gonna be quick no matter how slow your, your application or your underlying hardware is. So compared to, certainly compared to running, querying those millions of rows in the underlying table. 
So as I said, the database can do this transparently. So then you don't need to go through all your code and go, well, we created a materialized view for this. Let's change it to use a materializing view instead. It will do this transparently. With one important gotcha and one important caveat. Data that was returned by the query and the data that's stored in the materialized view must be the same. So they must match exactly. There can't be any differences whatsoever. There is a trick to get around that. Um, I'm not going to get into it in too much detail today. Um, but by default, the data stored in the materialized view and the data that's stored in the base tables it's um, to derive from must be the same. They must be identical. Um, because you know, in Oracle, we generally take the default position of you want the most accurate up-to-date information unless you tell us otherwise. So, you know, if someone adds um, an extra order for last month, you know, some kind of reconciliation process or cancels a whole bunch of orders, that materialized view will be invalidated and the query rewrite will no longer happen. So this is a problem, right? You know, if we, potentially we're going to change this materialized view and we're not going to be able to use it anymore. So the important question then is, well, how do we keep materialized view up to date? How do we make sure it stays in sync with the data that's in the real tables? So there's various options that you can specify when creating a materialized view to do this. So we'll just run through these brief briefly. I'll start off by looking at when it is you actually do the refresh. So the first thing you can say is, well, we want to do it on demand. So we are going to explicitly request the refresh of the materialized view. Um, maybe you'll schedule a job, or maybe you'll be part of the application, some button people can click, something like that. Whatever, you have to explicitly call DBMS in view, you know, refresh to get it up to date. So that's good, but it's some work, and there's always going to be a period of time when it's slightly out of date. You know, really, you want that data to be up to date and as fresh as possible. So you can also specify it as on commit, and in this case, the database just kind of automatically keeps it up to date every time you commit a transaction that the materialized um, view uses. So any of the tables in there, any time you insert, update, delete them, if you save that change database will refresh that automatically. So you don't then need to do anything else. Nice and easy. Um, but we'll come back to that in a minute though. And then there's another option called on statement refreshing. So this is something that we introduced in 12.2. Um, again, this is automagic. It happens without you having to do anything. It happens after every single DML statement, every insert, update, or delete. And you do not need to actually commit it for the change to be reflected. So it's as soon as the statement's finished. So that also means if you roll back that insert, then it will be undone and taken back out of the materialized view. Um, I'm not going to talk about this in too much de detail, partly because it's fairly new, but also there are a lot of restrictions around this. Mostly you can just use it to join tables, and that's about it. But it's worth being aware that it exists. So those are times you can do it. You can ask for it, or you can have it automatically happen when you commit or after you run DML statements. Next thing um, you want to say is how you actually do the refresh. So there's again, there's a few options, and there's two key options here. The first of those is you say you're fast refreshing. You'll take the changes that um, have happened to the underlying table since you last did the refresh and apply those. So we're going to only run, you know, Few out, you know, few minutes or time since the last transaction changes or the current transaction changes, depending on when exactly you're doing it. Um, the other option is you can do a complete refresh, and here, when refreshing the materialized view, it reruns the underlying query completely. So it just reruns the query again from scratch. Um, and you know, this is okay for you know a reasonably quick query. You know, we were getting the count of rows uh, sales per day in a particular month, that might be relatively quick. Too slow for the users to wait for, but you know, still on the order of several seconds or a few minutes. So a complete refresh is possible. Quite often when you use materialized views, the underlying query can take several minutes, maybe even hours to run. And this is why you want to pre-compute the results. Um, in which case, mm, yeah, okay, a complete refresh probably isn't going to cut it. Um, 
So those are two options, fast or complete. And then there is a final option, which is called force. Now, this is really just saying choose. Do a fast refresh if you are able to, and if you are not able to, then do a complete refresh. Um, there are some things, some operations you can do which invalidate fast refresh on a materialized view, such as truncating the underlying tables. So force can be useful in some circumstances, but in most cases, it's better to be sure about what you're gonna get. Have fast or have complete. Otherwise, you can get very kind of swingy behavior. Most of the time, it's fast and it's nice and quick, and then every now and again, it suddenly goes really slow and you get a complete refresh. So it's good to be, you know, force is good if you, um, are prepared to take the kind of um, swing in behavior. So we've looked at the kind of when and how, and um, the question is, how do these combine? Now, most of these you can actually do at the same time, except for the on statement. So with on statement, you materialize view must be fast refreshable. You can't use it for complete refreshes. Um, which kind of makes sense, you know, if you're going to be refreshing materialized view after every single insert, update, and delete, and that query is going to take a while, well, you know, your system's probably going to fall apart if it's doing a complete refresh of that query. So it has to be fast refresh if you're going to go on statement. Um, now, when it comes to on commit, while you can do a complete refresh of the table, Chances are you probably don't really want to, because um, again, you know, even if the complete refresh is pretty quick, let's say, you know, I don't know, half second, second, couple of seconds, think about it. If you've got a really busy system, so you're getting about a million transactions a day, so that's 10 a second or so. If every second, those 10 transactions, they do an extra half a second of work, well, you're adding five seconds of work to your system, every second, just refreshing that materialized view. Probably not great. So it's very rare that you would want to do a complete refresh on a on commit materialized view. Maybe circumstances, but you know, highly unusual if you ask me. So the place that generally you want to be with materialized view is on this bit. You want to be fast refresh on commit. But as I say in the slides here, there are a whole stack of restrictions to this. You know, we are very limited as to what you can do in a fast refresh on commit materialized view. So just to give you some idea. So I had a look at the docs, the latest docs, 18C, and pulled out the general restrictions on fast refresh. And you can see there is, I know, two, maybe three pages worth of restrictions there. And um, I say that's the, the latest 18C documentation, the restrictions We've reduced some of them over time, but there are still a lot of um, limitations. So it's important to be aware of those. So how do you know you've hit those limitations? What can you do about it? You know, you wanna create this fast refresh on commit materialized view. How do you know if it's possible? So, you know, clearly I don't really have time to go through all those options blow by blow. It's gonna be boring for all of us. So I just wanna take you through some of the principles about how you would actually manage that. Um, and first thing you wanna do is you'll create this table in the MV capabilities table. And what this will do is store information that the refreshes that are possible when you actually do it. Um, it is possible to uh, get this information without a table. You can store it in an array. Um, it's a bit messy. You can do things like create a table function to extract the information out to do it in SQL. But generally, I much prefer to just store it in a table because then you can easily query it and do what you want afterwards. So we've got this table. Next thing we want to do is explain the materialized view. And as you can see here, what I'm doing is literally pasting in the definition of the materialized view. So we're just saying, here's my create materialized view statement. What can it do? What refresh options are available? So after running that, what it, it will then, um, we query that capabilities table and we can see what's possible. Well, we can see that we got a complete refresh is possible. There's a whole stack of refresh fast options and the possibility for all of those says no. Okay, no, that's, this isn't very promising, right? So why is this? Well, there is also a message column, which gives you a bit more information about what's actually going on here. And if we take a look at um, one of those, we'll see that the detail table does not have a materialized view log. So what's that, what does that mean? Well, 
as I said, to do a fast refresh, what we want to do is apply the changes since the last time we refreshed the materialized view. In order to do that, we need somewhere to store what those changes are. We need to know what's happened since the last refresh. And that is what the materialized view log is. Every time you do some DML on the table with a materialized view log on it, it says what you did and when you did it. So when you come to chain update the materialized view, it can look at that log and then apply those changes to it. So the thing we want to do now is create the materialized view log on our sales table. So we do that, we've got our materialized view log, and let's go ahead and try and create our materialized view. And we'll do that and fast refresh on commit. Hopefully this is gonna be right. Well, we run it and we run into a lovely little area like this. Cannot use row ID column. Hmm. Okay, well, what's the problem here? Well, good thing is um, when you create materialized view log, it actually creates a real table in your database. It's called mlog dollar underscore whatever the table name is. And you can look at it and see a bit about what's actually going on. So we just describe that table. We can see it contains these columns. So order ID, snap time, some other dollar dollar type information. Remember what our query was. We wanted to count how many orders were placed by that for each day. So we're selecting the order date column. Well, where is that order date column in our log? It's not there, right? We're trying to apply what the changes are to the materialized view, but we've got no data to do it. So, you know, how do we do this? Um, and this, in order to capture this, we need to change the materialized view log definition. We need to rebuild that table essentially so it includes the order date and any other columns from the table that are going to appear in the materialized view. So we can drop that, recreate it, and we've got this. Um, brackets here, which we can just list the, all the columns from the table that we want to appear in the materialized view. And we've got the including new values clause. So saying every time there's a change, say what has changed and what that new value is. So we can apply that to the materialized view at the next fast refresh. So we do that, put the materialized view log, and there we go. We've got the order dates and we can see what they are. Great, we're making some progress. So we can build a fast refresh on commit materialized view. So I'm going to try that, but in the meantime, new requirements come in. We don't want just want to count how many orders we placed each day. We also want to see how many different customers place an order each day. Um, so we can get um, some idea of how many repeat customers we're getting and things like that. We do that and we get the lovely, you know, Aura 1254 can't set the on commit ref refresh attribute. And this is where it just gets, you know, the, one of the least helpful um, error messages considering you know all those restrictions the two or three pages and all we've got is something telling us we can't do it so this is where this mv capabilities table is really handy um i in my past i've spent hours of my life probably even days fiddling around with this trying to get materialized views to work but we do that and we'll run it for this so we remember we're looking for the distinct customer id and um, so we'll look for the message text for refresh fast after insert. It's telling us distinct clause on a duplicate sensitive aggregate function. Hmm, okay, well, what does that mean? Well, problem here is we are capturing the distinct, we're taking all the customer IDs and we're just collating them all down to one number. So we've lost the detail. So if we take a look at our customers, we can see we've got some various orders, various customers, and we've got count of those four distinct customers. In the materialized view, we've lost that information. We no longer have the customer ID in it. We've just got this number four of how many different ones there are. So let's say somebody insert customer ID four comes along, buys something, inserts row in the sales table. Is that a new customer or not? Hmm, interesting question. Um, now, if you're paying attention closely to the previous slide uh, or you, and you've got a good memory, you might realize that customer ID here for here is in fact new. But if all you're given is you've got, there's four different customers and there's a new customer ID, well, there is no easy, there's no way to reverse engineer that. You can't say, is that part of the original data set? So this is a problem. Um, so it seems like we're kind of stuck now. We can't use materialized views for this. Um, or at least not fast refresh materialized views. Well, 
there is a way around it. Um, rather than including the count distinct in the materialized view, what we can do is change the level of aggregation. So now we are counting the number of orders placed by each customer each day. So we're grouping by customer and order date. Now, because customer ID is part of that um, base level detail, we can actually aggregate that up uh, to use this materialized view to do the count distinct. So this is good, you know, we made some progress, but chances are, so as I say, we can use this for our count distinct, chances are this hasn't reduced the size of the data set very much. Um, you know, a lot of businesses, few, Customer, most customers will place at most one order a day. You know, you might get a few place a whole batch of orders on a particular day. Um, you know, things like banking transactions. Maybe some people will have a whole set of things go on a particular date. You know, um, I've got a lot of my bills that will go out on the first of each month, so I could have several transactions on a particular day. But in general it's unlikely that you're going to have a lot of duplication here. You know, you're probably lucky if you average two sales per day per customer. That would be a great um, win or very lucky there because then you could halve the underlying data set, which is good. You know, we're taking 30 million rows down to 15, but it's nowhere, nothing like taking 30 million rows down to 31. You know, that was many orders of magnitude reduction. So while this can help here, um, Reading materialized view is still going to be a lot of rows. Um, so we've saved a little bit, but not saved everything potentially. So um, that's great, but you know what can we do? Um, you might go, so, well, do we need two materialized views now? We can have the original where we're just counting up by day, and this one where we're counting by customer by day. And you can do that. You can have two completely separate materialized views. What you can also do is chain materialized views on top of each other. So if we've got our sales materialized MV and we're counting the orders per date and customer ID, we add a primary key to that, add a materialized view log on the materialized view. So you can't, it's not just on base tables on materialized views themselves. We can now create the materialized view, fast refresh um, on commit using that sales materialized view. Um, and we can use this materialized view to count up how many orders were placed each day. So you can chain things up together and pile them on top of each other. So has anyone got any um, questions or comments on this? Um, before I move on, you know, I'm aware I've been talking a lot and not anyone, um, anything, anyone that need more clarity on or, oh, so yeah. So I've got a question come in from Ang Schumann. Um, if you could make sure when you put questions, comments in chat, if you could send them to everyone, that'd be great. So we can all see them. Um, but question coming in. One issue we often face with materialized view is if the materialized new view needs to be refreshed frequently in data source table is huge, then prior to 12.2 are on demand and on commit a good option. In OLAP environment, we usually avoid creating materialized view for dashboard data source where pre-computing is not possible and when the date range is ranging from historical date to current timestamp. Could you please suggest something tuning such query instead of using materialized view, maybe in some other session, would really appreciate. Um, so if you could give us a bit more information about what the challenge is, and because, so the thing is, you're saying prior to 12.2, on demand and on commit um, but options, they, well, you know, it's it depends on what information you're doing and what you're trying to get. Um, on commit will add to your commit time processing something I'm going to discuss in a second, but it keeps the data up to date and in sync the whole time. However, when you do it uh, on demand, there is always going to be a period of time when the materialized view is slightly out of date. So you refresh the materialized view, the instant after that, it's almost certain that very shortly after someone's going to change that data. So you no longer get the um, instant query, the query rewrite capabilities. 
However, for something, um, you can still actually run queries against materialized view itself. You can query the materialized view directly. Or you could say, well, actually, we don't care. We want the stale information. The information in that is good. Um, we don't care about the most up-to-date detail. So you can override this behavior. You can, um, there's a session parameter, query rewrite integrity. You set that to stale tolerated, and it can still use materialized view. Um, now, when it comes to a dashboard, it, can, it depends on what kind of dashboard this is. Quite often, um, these kind of hourly sales or recent sales dashboards are used as a way to kind of validate that you know the system's working, customers are actually buying stuff, in which case you need the data to be up to date and correct. Um, now, the question here is, you know, what exactly you're hoping to show? Something rather than using materialized view, if you just need to know how many orders have been placed in the past hour, maybe the past day, just strand, uh, standard indexing is likely to be enough to give you a good performance for that query. Obviously, it depends on your system. If you can give a bit more detail on that, and um, that would be useful. Um, but let me know if that helps or if um, any more information you want to give. But as I mentioned, we've got this option where we're talking about uh, on-demand or on-commit. And you do kind of have this dilemma where you say, well, you know, we want the up-to-date data, but either it slows down our commit enough, or um, we don't have that, or, you know, we're not able to bear that overhead, particularly if we've got a lot of these materialized views um, that we want to keep up-to-date. So you're kind of thinking to yourself, well, you know, I've got this materialized view, and then I base another one on top of that, and maybe base another one on the original one or combine some other ones in some strange ways. Potentially, that's going to throw things down a lot, um, particularly if you have got a really busy system that does a lot of um, transactions per second. You may not be able to cope with that overhead. It may be too much for your system. So what can you do? Well, 12.2 does have another option available to you here. And that is it. you can um, enable get the up-to-date information at the query level. So each time you run a query against a table or run your query where there's a matching materialized view, what it's able to do is use the materialized view as the basis for the data, but they kind of do a mini refresh just for your query to get the up-to-date information. So if we've enabled on query computation and it's using the stale materialized view or out-of-date materialized view as the basis. So we've got our query, we're counting how many um, sales there are for each day in some time period. It's able to split that into two parts, essentially. Get the bulk of the information from the materialized view and get the changes that happen from the materialized view log. And uh, I'm sorry, my phone is ringing. I'll have to cancel that. Um, and it can combine those to get the most up-to-date information. So essentially what it's doing is union, unioning the materialized view with the materialized view log. So your query gets the correct up-to-date information, but the materialized view stays out of date. Um, so this can be a good option if the overhead of fast refresh on commit is too much for your system. Um, you can do a refresh on demand, so set up a frequent schedule where we're doing it, say every minute, every five minutes, every hour, something like that. But your queries can still get nice, good performance boost. Um, important thing to be aware about this, it's reading the changes out of the materialized view log. So the longer the time it has been, it's been since your last refresh, the more changes it's going to have to apply to the materialized view to get the up-to-date information. So if you are refreshing infrequently or infrequently relative to your transaction rate, let's say you only refresh once a day, as the day goes on, that query is going to get a bit slower and slower because it's got more and more work to do to apply those all those changes since the previous day's refresh. Um, and it'll get slower and slower through the day until midnight, you refresh it, and then it's nice and quick and get slower and slower again. So you're going to have to play around and tweak to find where the sweet spot is. 
Also worth bearing in mind is that this is a cost-based optimization. So just because it's possible doesn't mean it's guaranteed that it will happen. Database may still decide to run the base query itself, you know, go to the underlying table. Um, so do bear these things in mind. So um, I've talked a fair bit about fast refresh. Hopefully that gives you some insight to some of the possibilities. I'm just going to round up with some tips. Um, if you've got any questions or comments on this, please put them in chat while I do so. So, um, like I say, really when you've got a materialized view, what you really want to aim for is fast refresh on commits. Keep that data up to date so you can really benefit from material, uh, the query rewrite or just querying it directly. However, as we saw, there is a massive bucket of restrictions to this and it is quite likely that you're going to try and write a query um, which will not be fast refreshable. Um, so do bear that in mind um, and you know if you are on 12.2 and you're finding the on commit overhead too great look at the on statement. Uh, you, I meant to say on query on query computation there rather than on statement. Um, well after change my slides later, but look at on query computation. You could also look at on statement as well, but do bear in mind that materialized view is pretty much restricted to just joins, you know, no aggregations, counts, and so on. Um, also, as much as possible, try and build generic materialized view. So at the start, I was building that materialized view, which included the where clause, restricting it just to August. So that's great, we've got nice fast performance for August, but what happens when we want to go back to July or as time goes on and we want to do this month's data? Well, that materialized view is irrelevant anymore. You don't want to have to be dropping and recreating a materialized view each time. Um, strip out as much of the where clause as possible. You know, occasionally you might have um, some cutoff date in the past where you don't care about information for, but generally you want to aggregate all your data. Also, work at the lowest level of aggregation you can. So, you know, if you've aggregated by um, day, if that's good enough for you, let's say you want to ca calculate totals, not only by day, by week, by month, and by year. Well, if you just build a day level aggregation, the database can still use that materialized view to actually calculate the weekly, monthly, and yearly totals without having to go to the underlying table. Um, so stick to low levels of aggregation as possible and then tactically build up on top of that as you find you need the extra things for performance. Also bear in mind, you do not need to exactly match your query. You know, There's a lot of smarts built into these rewrites um, and can take advantage of you know, basic math. For example, if you want to calculate the average value of sales for the day, so the mean um, value per order. Well, as long as your materialized view has the sum of the order values for each day and the count of the order values for each day, it can com compute the mean from those. So there is a lot of transformations possible um, just using some you know, basic math operations. Um, so think about that. You know, quite often you can build more general materialized views than you think you need. You can, you might have a set of 20, 30, 40 queries, but actually you may only need, you know, five to 10 materialized views to improve the performance quite notably for all of them. So spend a bit of time doing that kind of analysis. Also very important, you know, the DBMS MView packages explain for you and explain rewrite. They really help, they, you know, they're not perfect. It still can be a bit fiddly, a bit head scratchy to figure out what's going on, but that should always be your first port of call to figure out what's actually happening. So let's move on to a question that we came that came in. So person had these two tables, a table of apples and a table of oranges. And there's some overlap or some commonality between these tables. As you can see, the first two lines, they both have the same ID, both have the same variety. Um, but then as things go on, they kind of fall apart a bit. There's some, so we've got carrot. I didn't realize carrot was a variety of apple, but I don't know, maybe this is just some sample data, um, which is not in the oranges table and Valencia, which is not in the apples table. And we've got two IDs, two ID fives in the oranges table. So what this person wanted to do was to combine these two tables. So you can see the matching rows from both of them 
and the unmatched rows for both of them. Excuse me. So we see something like this. We also wanted to see a count of the rows for each variety. So you can see the unmatched rows. So we see carrot apple um, has no matching orange. So that row appears null and there's a count of zero for it. Excuse me. Similarly, Valencia has this similar for the apples table. And then these oranges, navel and banana, um, which we have two with the same ID. For the apple count, we wanted to have a incrementing counter for those ones. Um, and they wanted to know how to do this. So what they did is they proposed a query like this, left join the apples to the oranges and then right join the apples to the oranges, which is a good start. It kind of gives you the good principle, but you know we've got a double outer join here. It's not something you see very often, which is probably why a lot of people don't realize we got this thing called a full outer join, which does exactly that. It does the double outer join, um, you know, giving the unmatched rows from both tables in a single query. So we've got that information and we now wanna run, add the running count to it. So we got our table that looks like this. We can see our null unmatched rows. Um, what we wanna do is count the number of rows for each ID. So we want the apple count, the running count of those. Um, so we need to count the ID. If we just do a count star, we'll get six. By counting the ID, we count the non-null values. So at this point, we get a count of five. Of course, that's not what we want. We want the count for each ID. So you need to partition by it, which then casts it up. So now we can see Fuji, Gal, and Carrot, count of one, and we've got the fives, uh, two of the fives. Um, but we wanna make that running count. So what we need to do is sort by the variety in the oranges table. So this is the values that are changing for each um, ID over here. So we put all those together and that forms a analytic function. So we see we've got a count, counting the ID over partitioning by the Apple ID and then ordering by the oranges variety. So we're counting one ID and partitioning by it and then sorting by the variety in another column. That gives us the running count for the apples. For the oranges, we'll do the same. We'll just flip the values around or switch the tables around for those. Um, we do all that and we'll get the table that we're looking for. So um, that's what I had prepared. That's what I had in, uh, in advance. If anyone's got um, more questions either on what we just covered, materialized views or any other general SQL questions, um, please drop them in chat. So I can see there's been some chat going on. Judith saying back to the real time materialized views. There is an example in the data warehouse guide that uses join. Uh, okay, yes. Okay, thanks. A follow up question. What is the likelihood to bring the updatable materialized view advanced replication feature back? Um, so, as far as I know, this is part of the, uh, this feature has been deprecated and I don't, I think it's unlikely you, this is gonna come back. Um, so just for some background, can you give, let me know why it is you want this or what you want to use this for? Um, let's see if there's maybe some other way you can achieve what you're trying to do. Okay, so we have 100 physical database and replicate metadata across all of them. Okay, go on. Yeah, you currently use the materialized view to replicate it. And then the, the update has to hit the master. Yes. So you're replicating across database links. Is that materialized view goes across the database link? Is that what you're doing? Yes, okay. Um, John, so what is the, why is, why do you need the, uh, what is the better approach to replicate this metadata? <laughs> um, this is one of these things that is always a um, tricky problem. I mean, so these 100 physical databases, you know, uh, why why do you have so many different databases? Why what is why do they have them all separately? I think that's probably 
the first interesting or important question, you know, why aren't they all in, why don't they have the data all in one database? Because that's one of the first things that you, because we can't fit into a single database. Okay, go on. What do you mean you can't fit it into a single database? What are we, each of there are three terabytes of memory? Okay. And how big is this data that, or that you're replicating? Or how, how, you know, what's the size of your, you know? Okay, so you're replicating 200 gigs of data, right? So why, um, okay, 30, 30 petabyte, right? That's, yeah, okay, that's a big size database. Okay, and the data you're replicating is some kind of common data that is similar to all the, you know, applies to everything and each database has its own private data as well. Is that right or? That is correct. Yeah, um, so, I mean, this is, sounds like you've kind of built your own DIY type sharding solution. Um, so it's, it's essentially one application you just split across separate instances because the database is so large, you know, you, you're just not able to manage those, the size of that data across one thing. Mm -mm. Okay, so, you know, this is, um, at this kind of scale, this, this is something, yes, sharding and lookup detail still uses materialized view. Um, I mean, the this is where there's, there's no kind of necessarily easy solution to this. Um, obviously, we now have our own sharding in um, Oracle database. Um, however, that's potentially going to be a fair bit of work for you to look into and integrate into the, you know, your application, depending on how custom it or how it all fits. Um, there are various other kind of replication technologies available, which you could use to do this rather than materialize view. Um, so you've got your uh, single table and you want to push all the updates to all your shards um, as you've, as the changes happen, basically. Is that correct? Yes. You mean at, um, advanced queuing? No. So um, I wasn't thinking, I was thinking about more kind of um, separate technologies altogether. So, you know, we've got our replication technology, Golden Gate, but there are various other um, companies who also have ways which you can send data um, from one database to others. And, you know, that's certainly kind of, this is part of the reason where we're kind of deprecating things like, doop doop, um, things like that. So, um, you know, things you've got to look at, well, I guess questions are things like, you know, how frequently are you updating this master table? What kind of latencies are you actually wanting to deal with? Um, I mean, this is an interesting and tough problem and is something where really you need to, it's good to get someone who actually can sit down and understand your full problem um, and discuss through you with all the various options with you. Um, so you just kind of comment, we once used such a scenario which slave was updatable and then trigger to propagate changes online to a single master database table. And also in addition, each site was refreshed from master table kind of a manual advanced replication. But for now, for update was deprecated, not clear to me why. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so they say, if you're able to, you can look at sharding, uh, Oracle sharding, or you can look at um, various other replication technologies to manage this. Um, again, it's gonna come down to, you know, <laughs> What, 
what your latency requirements are, how up to date, how frequently transactions are changing, what is changing, um, how you handle failure is also an important question. You know, with 100 sending information out to 100 databases, something's going to go wrong in that process at some point. You know, just hardware fails, failures, and so on. Um, so, you know, we're happy to talk through options with you, but I think there's something where you really should get someone to come in who, who is able to sit down with you and discuss through all the options with you properly. Okay, so another question come in. In my opinion, what is better choice? Materialized view on a table or materialized view on a synonym? To be specific, where source table and materialized view in two different schemas and materialized view refresh occurs hourly and the source tables keep updating frequently. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what the, uh, what the advantage is of getting a synonym would be. I mean, other than you don't have to prefix the schema. You know, I'd, I'd go against the base table, source table and materialized view. And um, because if you've got that synonym, you, you're ex introducing an extra link in the chain where something could go wrong. Um, if someone, for whatever reason, changes that materialized view, you can uh, changes the synonym, you know, updates the definition or does a recompile on it or something, um, then you can end up invalidating the materialized view. Whereas you're just going against the base table, you know, that's fine. Um, and you know I can't see many you know other than making your query marginally simpler, easier to type. I'm not sure what benefit you're getting from the synonym. So sharding as many limitations also requires the update of the duplicated tables to be formed in the directory database. So it's not clear to me how an application update both sharded and duplicated tables. It is via MV. Okay, so so when you say it's via a materialized view, you're just updating one table and pushing the changes to all the other tab, all the other databases. Let's say the synonym is using DBLink to connect to the source table in another. So why? Okay, that's an interesting extra addition you've got in there saying you've got you're using a synonym to hide a DB link, a database link to a table in another schema in the same database. It, you, it is in the same database, right? You're not using the database link to go across to another database. No, no, which, which no. <laughs> two separate, you've got, so you've got two separate databases. When you say separate schemas, they're not on the same physical database, right? Um, okay, it's worth bearing in mind that there are even more restrictions. <laughs> no, it's okay. It's worth bearing in mind that there's even more restrictions um, for refreshing when it comes to going across the a database link. There is a little section where it lists out a few more possibilities there, which you know um, has that. I mean, you know, the the advantage of a synonym is you kind of got location independence. So if you change the name or change the database link for the underlying object, then you don't need to change your um, query. But, uh, you know, I don't see if you're going to be changing that stuff anyway, if you're going to point the database link to it, you, you know, change the synonym to a new database link, um, you're going to break materialized view refresh anyway. I'm pretty sure you will. Um, so, you know, that advantage is kind of lost in the sense that it's pretty unlikely that you're going to substitute, change that synonym to something else, a different table, a different database link, and everything's just going to work fine as it did before when it comes to your materialized view refresh. Um, so, you know, okay, um, 
you know, it might help for things like uh, as you move through your environments, so dev, test, production, um, you can use the synonym, constant synonym name in all of them, um, but have different database links in the underlying thing. But other than that, I'm not sure what advantage using the synonym is giving you. All right. I don't know if anyone else has got any thoughts or comments on that. But that's my thoughts on the matter. Maybe we need more time to discuss. Okay. Well, yeah, you can um, pop it down as something for us to discuss either in the next session or discuss in more detail. But yes, I, I guess maybe I'm missing something and maybe there's more information that I'm not getting here. Okay, so we are coming up to the hour. Has anyone got any other comments or some questions on the topics we've covered so far? <laughs> there exists an undocumented trick which you can update a read-only materialized view, maybe combining that trick with a trigger that propagates change to a massive uh, to the table. Yeah, I'll be very wary of re relying on doc undocumented tricks. Um, particularly for what I'm guessing is quite a key database for something that is something that size. <laughs> you saved the world many times using that trick. Yeah. Yeah, I think we've all saved the world using undocumented tricks probably at least once. Um, but well, you've got to decide what your risk is and you know what the long term impact of it is. Anyway, so just want to Thank you all for joining me. Hope you enjoyed this. More importantly, I hope you learned something. Um, as I say, these are monthly sessions. If you've got something you would like us to cover, then please submit a question in advance and we will um, cover it in a future session. And enjoy the rest of the day. And thanks for joining me. All right.